The Real Investment Show. Thursday, that means that Michael E. Wood shows up. He kind of, you know, strolls out of bed this early in the morning. <laughs> to talk about his favorite topic, the Fed. You're not wearing your I Love Jerome Powell shirt this morning, Mike. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> I should be. I had a big <laughs> announcement yesterday that, that I don't think too many people picked up on. Which was? They are going to start tapering. They didn't announce it, but they told you that they were going to do $15 billion a month starting in November. So uh, I think what's important about that is we knew that was coming. The street knew it was coming. Market knew it was coming. But they've, they've kind of created a benchmark for themselves, $15 billion. If that number increases, say they get to the meeting in November and they say we're going to do 20 or we're going to do 10, that tells you a little something about what they think about inflation. Right. Inflation is the driver at this point. Mm -hmm. Employment's come down far enough that that getting the inflate, getting the unemployment rate back to where it was, I don't think is the issue. They've they've gotten it back close enough. But inflation is running hot. And we hear every Fed speakers telling you that. So I think the 15 billion is now our benchmark on how they feel about inflation. So if they come out and do 20, you know, it may not be November, maybe January, maybe March. Right. That tells you they're getting more concerned about inflation. So. That's, I think, what was so important yesterday. Um, not just the fact that they are going to taper because they laid out a pretty good plan. Well, you know, it's interesting. So twofold. One is, you know, when we're talking about inflation right now in particular, it's really some things that are more anomalous events, right? Uh, we've got supply chain disruptions that are, you know, crimping supplies. And, of course, when you have, uh, you know, increased demand and a lack of supply, you're going to have higher prices. Um, we've got, uh, you know, the other problems coming in from, you know, higher rent prices that were occurring because when home prices went up so much that people couldn't afford to buy a house, they went back to rent. That started driving back rent prices, uh, started going back up. So we've got some things that are occurring in the economy that really have not really not a whole lot to do with monetary policy. And what I mean by, you know, the, the Fed buying bonds really isn't affecting the supply chain disruption, nor did it cause it. That was the act of shutting down the economy. So while I'm not arguing the fact that they need to cut back on liquidity, they probably should have done it a while back when the markets were really screaming hot. But, um, you know, they're always kind of wait too late to start these things. Um, I'm not sure that's really going to have any impact on the inflationary pressures that are happening in the economy. Right. A lot of these have really nothing to do with, like, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about how it's money supply and velocity. That's what you need to know, Right. There, there are other factors, right? If all of a sudden every producer of everything decided to raise prices 10%, doesn't matter what money supply or velocity you're doing, prices are going to go up 10%. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the way OPEC controls the price of oil to some degree. Right. But, you know, what we're seeing now are all these odd, strange supply line problems. You know, it was Apple yesterday or two days ago saying they can't get enough chips. The automakers have been telling us that for a long time. And it's going on in... You know, you try to you go shopping for things and you see it all the time and you talk to the, uh, you know, to the to people working at the store and they say, yeah, we haven't had those in two months. We hope to get more. You know, look at our, you know, I'm, I'm getting a new computer. Right. It's taken two months. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, because the Biden administration yesterday asked you know, retailers like Walmart and, and other you know big domestic retailers to up their production to help offset these supply chain disruptions. And, you know, a lot of the products that Walmart gets, they don't produce their own products. They, they right. buy them from other people. And I am sure that if they wanted to get more product, they would have already tapped on the shoulders of their producers saying, hey, we need more product, you know, and the, the producer's already saying, hey, I'm giving you everything I got, you know, it's kind of like Scotty in Star Trek. I've got it all I've got, man. And, you know, the problem here is that we just can't get any more production. You know, we've got, you look off the, the coastlines in Gulf of Mexico, as well as in LA, their ships just docked out there, can't get unloaded. Uh, the Port of LA announced yesterday they're about to go to 24-7 operations to try to unload some of these ships. There doesn't really seem to be a short-term solution for solving these supply chain disruptions. Right. And the problem is, and this is what I wrote about in my article yesterday, you know, I put readers in the shoes of the, the, uh, the CEO of Acme Widget Company. And I said, okay, demand for widgets is off the charts. 
what do you do? And, you know, the option is you build a new factory and you hire new employees in a typical environment. Right. But if you think all of this is transitory, you know, if it's going to last three months or six months or even a year, you don't make a long term permanent investment. Right. You do everything you can to produce what you can, given your your factory, given the, the workers you have, you know, maybe 24 seven production. But there's no way that almost all industries are going to expand production for what they know. It, it's not what they think. It's what they know is a temporary boom in demand and, right. uh, you know, these supply problems. Well, so it, it's yeah. And, and it's interesting because, you know, you, mm -hmm. when you talk about companies and, and CEOs and what they're doing with their capital, right? I mean, you know, here you've got this, you know, amazing demand that's coming in. Um, we gave people trillions of dollars, you know, last year for to go spend money, and they did. So you've got all this demand. And what economists are thinking in, and if you look at economists' forecasts for economic growth, we're looking at 5% economic growth rates next year, um, you know, very strong rates this year. And the assumption is, is all that spending that people were doing last year is somehow magically going to continue into the future, despite the fact that those checks have now run out and people are returning back to their normal income. And I think the real key to the point you're saying, and I think the real key here to look at is what are companies doing with their capital? Are companies going out and, to your point, building new property, plant, and equipment to produce more stuff? I mean, look, if we can't get stuff from overseas, we could build a plant here and start producing our own stuff, right? We could start manufacturing domestically and, and get around some of these supply chain problems. But we're not doing that. What are we doing with our capital? We're doing stock buybacks. Stock buybacks just hit another all-time record last week. So, you know, companies are spending their capital on buying back shares to boost their earnings and to feather the the, uh, the earnings and, and incomes of executives rather than spending money to try to solve a supply chain disruption because they're saying what companies are telling you is, is that these supply chain disruptions are not permanent. They're going to resolve themselves and they don't want to commit the capital to fixing it when it's going to fix itself eventually. Right. The Fed has used the word transitory over and over and over again. And look, they are it, there's 400 PhDs at the Fed in economics. Right. And they still it, can't you, figure it out. Well, <laughs> right. But whether you agree with them or not, they, they're the ones telling you it's transitory. And if I'm the CEO of a company, is it going to be the 400 PhDs I listen to or Lance and Mike? Probably the 400 PhDs that are yelling transitory, right? right? They're telling you it's not going to last. And look, they're not dumb either. They know what's driving this. They know what's behind it. They know it can last another six months, but it's not a permanent situation. There's no reason our, there's no way our economy can grow at 5% barring massive fiscal stimulus. And, you know, maybe that's, you know, if you're banking on massive fiscal stimulus for years to come, well, then maybe you should build another factory. Right. But, you know, odds are that this midterm election is probably going to flip the House or Senate or possibly both towards the Republicans, which is then going to create a big logjam for any kind of future spending, at least for the next two years. Right. Well, you know, this is and, and it's, this kind of goes back to this whole conversation I was having just a minute ago. You know, B of A came out with their. 12 charts on net zero talking about the fact that we're looking at $150 trillion of new debt issuance to fund this, this fight against climate change. Um, this is all dependent upon governments issuing debt and central banks buying this debt. And, and going back to this fact that you've got 400 PhDs that can't ever get the economic growth right, um, certainly should make this kind of concern about their monetary policy and the effect that they keep thinking they're going to get that they don't actually ever get. Right. Right. And and some of it is, look, some of it is window dressing to serve their policies. Right. Sure. It, it's not it's not that those 400 PhDs are dumb. There are some incredibly intelligent people in there. And if you read their papers, they write great papers. Right. That 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 you and I would agree with largely. Sure. Yeah. But those rarely see the light of day other than geeks like us. <laughs> um, you know, so so they get it. But I think window dressing is very different you know they want to portray a certain economy they want to portray that the fed is doing doing you know great work for the people that that's their job that right. that inflation is a good thing all these things that are false are patently false the fed to some degree promotes mm -hmm. right 
some things they do are fine or good, but but they're they're dealing with image, and they're going to protect their image. Well, again, you know, they you know we go back and looking at the real impact of you know quantitative easing, and and it's interesting now that the treasuries and the central banks both have now taken on the fight of climate change and the fight of income equality, which is really well outside their purview of what their jobs are, right? We're just trying to figure out how to get, you know, these central banks involved in these social issues that we need to resolve somehow. But yet when we get right down into the crux of it, it's been a decade of zero interest rate policies, massive amounts of quantitative easing thrown into the markets that have created the wealth you know, inequality issues in the country. And they're sitting here going, okay, well, we need to fix it, but you're the one that caused it to start with. To fix it, well, you've got to stop what you're doing and, and and allow the rich to lose a lot of money in the markets, and then you'll start to, to equate things. Well, I would also say the Fed is partially responsible for some of the environmental issues, right? Lowering rates to zero meant everyone could get a, get a boat. They can buy bigger houses. They can basically expend more energy right. because everything because they could borrow borrow money cheaper. Yeah, if you want to so, uh, if you want to solve climate change, raise interest rates to about fifteen percent, and uh, problem you'll, solved. You'll solve your problem pretty quick. Absolutely. <laughs> Be right back after the break. Don't go away. So the Fed is talking about starting to taper their balance sheet um, starting in November now. At the run rate of $15 billion a month, if that's uh, the, the schedule they stick to, that means that pretty much QE will end sometime in June, July, uh, depending on the speed and pace at which they go. Now, of course, they can always you know, slow that down, speed it up, whatever they want to do. But to Mike's point, inflation is uh, right now causing a bigger issue for the Fed. Now, Interestingly, Mike, um, in their FOMC minutes, they made no mention of rate hikes um, yet. So again, kind of the, the big concern, I think, for markets is when we go back and look historically, you know, tapering tends to increase volatility of markets when they begin to taper their balance sheet. But what really tends to, you know, kind of derail markets is when they actually start hiking rates. And that historically always leads to bigger corrections or bear markets, you know, even though they didn't make any announcement, there are some clues out there right now that suggest we may see one or two rate hikes as uh, soon as 2022, which has moved up markedly from when they were originally talking about it maybe being in 2024. What are your thoughts? All right. You read my mind, Lance. Um, you know, I think what, what we've seen from the markets over the last week or so, week and a half, is that they are now saying, OK, you're going to start tapering. When are you going to start raising rates? Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, over the last, if, you, if you're if you kind of following the bond market, so, you know, you can just look at 10 and 30 year treasury bonds and then very short term bonds, like say two year, two year treasury notes and look at the difference in yield and how they're both moving. It's telling you a story. And what's going on there is that the difference between the two is compressing. So we're seeing 10 and 30 year yields fall while two year yields rise a little bit. So what that's telling you is they think the Fed is going to raise rates sooner than expected. As that happens, it kind of squashes economic growth. So if you're if you hold a 10 or 30 year bond, you have 10 years worth of cash flows. You don't really care about inflation in the first six months or year. You're looking at the next nine, mm -hmm. nine, nine and a half years. And it's going to bring down the growth rate for those years. So so if you just look at the yield curve, you can see that the, the Treasury market, Treasury market traders, investors are betting that the Fed's behind the ball. There's also much easier ways to look at it. You can look at euro dollars, euro dollar futures or Fed funds futures. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Fed funds, we we're looking at it yesterday, June. There's now a I believe it's like a 25 percent chance the Fed hikes by June of next year. And they're already pricing in more than one rate hike by the end of the year. Now, if you go look at any of the Fed language that they've talked about this, they don't anticipate hiking at all next year. So the market is saying, you're wrong. <laughs> you're going to be tightening. You're going to be raising rates before that. And again, I think this is all inflation based. Well, now and, you've done, and, and you've done the research before on this. How often is the market right about what they predict? Never. <laughs> the market, the, the market. I mean, I'm, I'm, talk, well, I'm talking about market. I'm talking about Fed funds futures. How often are they right versus wrong? 
they they tend to get it, but they but the interesting part is they tend to underestimate. So they get it, they get the direction, but they grossly underestimate it. I, we you're, you're referencing something I wrote a year or two ago, and it, if I recall, they underestimate it by about a percent or a percent and a half on average. Right. So is the Fed going to raise rates to one and a half percent? I you know I don't know maybe it, you know. If so, I think 10-year yields will be below 1.5% and we'll have what's called an inverted yield curve, which probably means we're in a recession or right. will be in a recession. Um, so it's just interesting. But, you know, these Fed funds futures, euro dollars, the Treasury curve, they're whippy, right? We could be back here next Thursday saying, that oh, was just a false alarm. <laughs> they're not pricing it in. So you want to see a more sustained trend, but kind of the initial vote from the markets is that the Fed is behind the ball, and Lance? If look at look at uh, look at the unemployment rate is 4.8 percent, right? In the Jolts report, where they talk about job openings, and they give some actually some pretty meaningful stats in that report, and it always comes out a couple of days after the employment report. They said that the quit rate is 2.9 percent, so 2.9 percent of the employable population have quit their jobs looking for a new job. That's a very good sign. It means they're confident mm -hmm. that they can get a better job, a better paying job, something they want in a job, right? So subtract uh, 2.9 from 4.8, and what do you get? You have a true unemployment rate, those that really can't find jobs of 1.9%. Right. You have inflation at 5.4%. What is the Fed doing? <laughs> why? Why are they... Why is the pedal to the metal? And they're still dilly dallying around about, you know, tapering QE by 15 billion. Mm -hmm. you, you go back and if you can, you can never even find a situation like that. But if you could, Fed funds would be at, you know, north of 5%. Right. Well, no, this is and this is what I was saying earlier is that, you know, the, the Fed's in a really tough spot here. Um, look, uh, they're not stupid. They know that if they start hiking rates and immediately quit doing QE, that these markets are going to decline by 20, 30 percent fairly quickly, if not more. Um, you'll immediately be in a recession. And then you've got the entire reverse problem on your hands, which is trying to get the economy from spiraling into a much deeper depression because we've actually not ever fixed any of the problems that we had going back to 2008. We've been papering over it for the last decade, you know, trillions of dollars of intervention, ultra low interest rates, all these things. And every time that we try to raise rates <clears throat> or try to reduce QE, we wind up in some type of fiscal crisis, whether it was, you know, the you know the 2018 sell off that we had three times in a row. And then um, you had the repo crisis, which led ultimately to the you know pandemic you know, shutdown, which led to that decline in recession. So, you know, all these things, every time we try to fix something, we've got to turn right around and bail out companies. We've got to bail out the banks. And I know the banks are we're, we're always told, oh, the banks are very healthy. So this is why we're allowing them to buy back shares and issue dividends. But as soon as we get into some type of economic trouble, we're having to bail the banks out to keep them from going bankrupt. So, you know, it just tells you how fragile this economy is. And this is why the Fed can't ever really get themselves extracted very much from doing these monetary programs because there is no support outside of it. And look, if you look at the minutes, they tell you they want to give the market as much advanced warning and they want to lay out the plan so that the market isn't shocked. Yep. I mean, they, they write about it. You know, if you read the minutes, you can read it in there that we want the market to understand what we're doing and agree with us, but basically and agree with us and don't go down because we're changing our policy. <laughs> exactly. That's what they're saying. That's what is keeping monetary policy where it is. Right. And it's it's very and a very inefficient way to run an economy. And that's why economic growth in, in part, not fully, is why it not is where it is because it's pretty high now but the trend economic growth is pretty low yeah. and it's gonna just get lower as we go forward because we've added more weight to this mule well, of a gdp yeah, but this is and this and again, so but again this goes back to what i was saying earlier so <coughs> now you're you're talking about b of a and this whole move for esg investing and and now the department of labor is saying hey we need to get esg funds into retirement plans 
you know, and we've talked about that there is no value to that at all. And it's actually less value to investors because they get charged a whole lot more for the funds that have really no, no net benefit to environmental or social governance. But, you know, it's a great narrative. But we're talking about $150 trillion more in debt to fund this problem. And yet the debt is a direct causation of why we can't get economic growth. But why does there seem to be this big disconnect between the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, the government, and, and, and the reality that you can't print your way to prosperity through you know, debt? It just doesn't work. Right. And look, ESG is already being gamed. These companies know what it takes to become ESG eligible. Mm -hmm. So to become, you know, ESG eligible, you have to fulfill certain things. Most of that is just BS lobbying to whoever <laughs> governs the board, right. right? Maybe buying a few carbon offsets, maybe having one of your buildings like a LEED certified building. They're, they are not, most of these companies are not really doing much, but they want to get on that list because there's a whole new pool of investors that can buy those stocks or bonds. Right. Exactly. And, and and it's not even looking at what technology they have, right? It, it's let's let's invest in companies that really can change our future, not you know, and let investors decide which companies those are. Right. Well, here, here's a, here's a great example of this, right? So, Mike, you and I, we're going to go buy a coal mine, and we're going to go back to polluting dirty coal, right? The most <coughs> the most dirty type of coal we can produce. We're going to produce that now. Obviously, not very carbon friendly at all. But we can get an ESG rating because all we have to do is shut down the coal mine temporarily, buy a bunch of carbon credits, be net zero, and we can get an ESG rating and have our company put into ESG funds. Now, how is that really solving any type of climate problem? No, it's not. And Lance, you wrote a report on this a little while ago where you looked at an ESG ETF and you looked at the SPY. Yep. And they were virtually identical, except for the extra, what, half a percent in fees or expenses? Uh, two percent in fees. <laughs> oh, sorry, two percent. But uh, they were virtually identical funds. Yeah, they, they, the top ten holdings were identical except for one, which was the fact that BlackRock put their own shares into the top ten holdings. So when people buy the ESG fund, it also drives up BlackRock shares of their own company of the ETF that they provide. You know, right. don't miss a good opportunity to double dip into an, right. <laughs> into an event, right? Here's the other thing. Those funds are not going to the companies. They're just going to some other investor that sold them to you. So you're not investing in yeah. in environmentally well, sound projects. I tell you what, we'll talk about the, the inability to do ESG through investing when we come back from the break. Don't go away. Met with a guy. As I said this morning, uh, B of A out with a very interesting report about $150 trillion worth of money needed to solve the climate change problem. And uh, we can all do this through investing, but it's an interesting situation. Again, when we've written articles about this, and as Mike mentioned earlier, if you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, uh, put ESG in the search bar at the top, and you'll find our, uh, there's been a couple of articles written about ESG investing, but Basically, the Wall Street money heist, which is simply the fact that Wall Street is simply just relabeling a lot of their funds now, calling them ESG funds. They're taking funds that were not getting any money inflows, right? Nobody wanted the fund because, well, it's just an old kind of large cap mutual fund, right? And what people are doing is now is relabeling those to be the ESG climate change fund and increasing the expense ratio by as much as twice so they're charging you more for essentially an old cruddy fund that nobody wanted to start with. So, you know, what is it that you're actually investing in is key and what are you paying for is, is important. But the other side is something that Mike just mentioned here just for the break, which is the one thing that nobody talks about is that you buying shares from somebody else doesn't do anything to solve climate issues. Right. I mean, you know, I, I see these commercials. There's a commercial on television is like, I want to invest in climate friendly companies. OK, that's fantastic. You need to go find a private company that isn't public, invest in that company that's going out to change the world. That is investing in a climate change friendly company, buying shares from somebody else. You know, if I buy Mike shares of Apple, 
<laughs> Mike has my money. I have his shares of Apple. I haven't invested in anything. I just gave Mike money, and I'm not doing anything to change the environment. Um, you know, this is the the one thing that, as investors, we need to really remember. Back in the late '90s, there was this whole movement not to invest in sin stocks. No gambling. No, uh, no pornography, no alcohol, you know, anything like that. You weren't supposed to invest in it. And there were whole funds that came out that were, that were sin stock free funds. Over the next five years, they underperformed the rest of the market. <laughs> so, you know, if you buy, if you would have owned the companies that were the sin stocks, they did fantastic. As investors, it's important to remember look, if you want to be, if you want to support climate change and be socially conscious and do these type of things, that's fantastic. Go do it. Go invest in causes. Go donate to company, you know, charity or charitable organizations that do those things. But when it comes to investing your money, invest your money to make a return on your investment because all you're doing is buying ethereal pieces of paper, hoping they go up in price to help increase your savings for retirement. Getting all this other stuff involved in your investment strategy is almost guaranteed to lose you money over time. Mike, your comments. No, you're absolutely right. You know, you said that uh, you, when you were comparing funds, the ESG fund had a 2% expense. The S&P fund had probably close to a zero expense, right? Right. Well, take that by the S&P fund, take that 2% and invest that in a private company charitable organization go buy some trees and plant them do do whatever it is that you think will help the you know whatever your cause is take your profits run your money in a silo manage your money in a silo mm -hmm. to make money to get you to retirement to meet your wealth goals objectives whatever whatever those goals are then you can take the profits from that and directly invest it into the environment directly do whatever you want to do with it mm -hmm. to help whatever it is you want to help. And that's that's what people ask me that a lot. Should I buy some ESG funds to help? I'm like, no, no. You, you know, the purpose of your money is to grow your wealth for you and possibly future generations so you can retire, mm -hmm. right, comfortably, in theory. The, now, you know, if you're going to retire comfortably, you can give some of those profits back. And you can help society in very many different ways. But don't give it to BlackRock. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the that's that's what that's what people don't understand. And yeah. I, I wrote an article a long time ago about how much money the banking sector makes as a percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. And when they got when they when they broke down the laws about 20, 30 years ago as to what the banks could do and couldn't do, their profits as a percent of GDP rose steadily. That's what in the article I called it the VIG. That's the VIG on the economy mm -hmm. for these banks. The VIG should be dropping. The, the amount of essentially tax, they're taxing our system to operate. And we should be paying them a tax. They provide a service. They, they lend money to Lance and they borrow it from me. You know, they take it from me and they provide that service. But given technology and given the global nature of things, that VIG or cost should be declining over time. It's been increasing. Right. They're becoming a bigger and bigger tax on the system. Well, and again, and, look, if, if, and, and to your point, right? So I, I want to be, I want to give my money to BlackRock and buy one of their ESG funds. That's great, but all that's doing is boosting their profitability. That money doesn't go into the environment. They don't have major, you know, climate change, you know, funding projects that they're, you know, doing. They're not going out and planting a billion trees this year. It's all going to the to their bottom line and into their pockets of their executives. I mean, Larry Fink is very well compensated. And that money's not going, that's going to his family. That's not going to help support the economy. So, you know, to your point, it's, it's a, you know, do, do things that have a direct impact on the economy. That's where your money should be invested. And again, you know, the, uh, as an example, after the financial crisis, uh, or actually say during the financial crisis, um, a lot of retirees lost a lot of money in their 401k plans and in their retirement pension plans. And there was a lot of, you know, shoddy funds that were in these pensions uh, and, and, and 401k plan lineups, and they weren't great funds. A lot of them went bankrupt and went out of business, and people lost a lot of money. 
And we and and after the financial crisis, we did a bunch of changes and got very serious about making sure that these retirement plans and custodial plans were much better regulated for the protection of the individuals in those plans. And we made sure that you had to have high quality mutual funds with long tenured track records of, of managers. They had to have low cost. And this is why today most of your uh, 401k plans you, you find the basic lineup, Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, you've, uh, you know, the low cost indexed funds in those plans. And that's great. And that's, that's, that's been a good enhancement for individuals investing in 401k plans over the last decade. We're now starting to reverse that as the Department of Labor is now considering changing the rules to allow these ESG funds, which have no track record, which have no long tenures of management and have exceptionally high fees to come back into these plans and, you know, essentially tax retirees and, and savers more to invest in something that really has no impact on climate at all. And, you know, this is to the benefit of Wall Street. And all this does is provide more money to Wall Street, less money to the actual environment itself. And investors wind up with less money in their pockets because of the fees. Look, I guarantee you Fink's got three, four, five houses, flies around in private jets <laughs> and uses more carbon than your whole block yeah. or, or even community. <laughs> so that's, the, you know, if that's what you think is giving back to the environment, go ahead, yeah. buy, buy those funds. I know, but and again, it's just you know this is um, if you actually read the statement from the Department of Labor, um, you know it's a very it's a very partisan politic based statement su suggesting basically that they have to do this to reverse the erroneous policies of the last administration. That's not your job on the Department of Labor, um, and especially when it comes to our risk of guidelines. The risk of guidelines are very simple, which is to try to do the best thing to provide the best fiduciary standards for retirement plan participants and they're doing exactly the worst possible thing they could do to them All right can so, i go off on yep. a tangent on something yeah, else for ahead. a second you got uh, four minutes so, so go for it so my friend brent as you know if you're if you listen to the show watch the show regularly sent me a shirt that said fed grammar matters right and i try to wear it every thursday after the fed meetings well apparently the fed understands that fed grammar matters too because they put out an article yesterday and I'm going to write it up today, and if you get our commentary, you can see it tomorrow, where basically they studied the language of the Fed presidents and the Fed statements and minutes and that sort of thing. And what they found out was that Chairman Bernanke was using language that was a, at a postdoc level, like a Ph.D. level. Now, Yellen wait, wait, wait. Did, they go, wait did they go back to as far as Greenspan? Because he was the master no, of Greenspan. He Only stopped. Bernanke. Well, let's see, they didn't. They didn't do enough study then, because Green, Alan Greenspan in the late '90s and early 2000s, he was the master of Greenspeak. That would have been too oh, hard. Of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now and then Yellen and now Powell. Well, according to the paper, they're at a 16th to 17th grade level. Remember, you graduate high school at the 12th level. Right. So that means that they're at either a uh, at least an undergraduate degree, you know, or a uh, postgraduate degree. Sure. So. So I think what that's telling you is what we're trying to tell you is that the Fed is using language on purpose because none of this stuff is that difficult, but they use difficult language to to do what they want to do and justify what they want to do. And, and this is important because the average American reads between the sixth and seventh grade level. Ouch. <laughs> so that's well, a 10 spread <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah you know so it, it's, it, and it's interesting i mean look you know this when you're writing your blog post and you're doing your seo work you know for for blog posts it tells you what your flash reading score is which is you know you know suggests that any type of difficult language you use is outside the realm of the average person to read it so you know this just you know <laughs> uh just the function of our education system, if anything else. <laughs> you know what we're going to do? We're going to copy and paste the Fed statement into our SEO thing and see what their flesh, flesh score is. I think, that's a great, I think that's a great idea. All right. That wraps up. So, Dave, Michael, thank you so much, of course. Get by the website. Our daily market commentary is out. Uh, we have a chart on that uh, 
150 trillion dollars to get to net zero carbon emission that chart is in our daily market commentary today along with our daily updates talk about the fed and of course all the earnings that are coming out this morning and this afternoon as we get into the heart of earnings season uh we'll touch on some of those earnings in our three minutes on markets and money today as well so uh stick around all that's coming up it's all on the website realinvestmentadvice.com that's realinvestmentadvice.com since your questions comments emails listen what we can do to help you and make sure and sign up for our live event on saturday it's our right lane retirement workshop at the dominion in austin we've got a couple of seats left so sign up today realinvestmentadvice.com see you back here tomorrow that's